afternoon. One of the highlights of NASB's legislative conference every year is when we have an opportunity to interact with um, leaders at the Department of Education and with and in Congress. And um, each year we try as hard as we can to have a conversation with the Secretary of Education. And that's the session that we're um, that we're doing right now is we get we get a chance to hear from and to visit with the Secretary of Education. We're particularly excited uh, to have with us today uh, Dr. Cardona who was sworn in just 20 days ago as the 12th U.S. Secretary of Education. So 20 days on the job, he's with us to, to, uh, to share his thoughts and to interact a little bit with our membership. But before Secretary Cardona uh, speaks, we're going to have him uh, to be uh, introduced by Alan Taylor, who is the um, president of the Connecticut State Board of Education. Uh, he can give you a personal introduction as a fellow board member because Immediately prior to becoming Secretary of Education, uh, Dr. Cardona was the Commissioner of Education in Connecticut. So we all know as state board members what that unique uh, relationship is between your state board and your commissioner or chief or whatever term you use in your state. That's a really special relationship and working together, that's how things get done. So it's my pleasure right now to introduce you to Alan Taylor, who has been with the Connecticut board now for nearly 30 years, and he will now introduce the secretary for us. Um, so, Alan, take it away, please. Thank you, Robert. I am honored and delighted to introduce Secretary of Education, whoops, Miguel Cardona. Although in many ways, I would prefer to be introducing him as Connecticut Commissioner Cardona, as he was until President Biden wisely chose him for his cabinet. Dr. Cardona's life is deeply embedded in the public schools. He intended elementary school in Meriden, Connecticut, secondary school at a state technical high school, and college and university at state institutions of higher education. After receiving his bachelor's degree in education in 1997, he began teaching elementary school in Meriden, Connecticut, the town in which he grew up. Six years later, he became the youngest school principal in Connecticut history. 12 years after that, he became an assistant superintendent in Meriden. Two years later, at the ripe age of 40, he earned his doctor of education degree with a dissertation on the achievement gap between English language learners and their classmates. In August 2019, on the recommendation of the Connecticut State Board of Education, he was appointed Commissioner of Education by Governor Ned Lamont. As we all know only too well, in less than a year, he had to guide our schools through the unprecedented crisis from which we are all still emerging. He did so with empathy and understanding for the concerns of the adults in the system, while insisting that we all remember that our schools children do not choose when they will be born and cannot put their growing up on hold. In my view, no one is or could be more committed to the belief that in securing the future of our country, our public schools are the most important institutions we have. Dr. Cardona. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Taylor. Uh, it's so nice to see you. Um, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. And uh, thank you, Robert, for the invitation uh, to NASB's uh, conference. And I'm honored to be here. As you mentioned, this is day 20. Uh, and I'm excited about the work ahead. I'm honored and humbled to serve as Secretary of Education, uh, as Alan mentioned, having served as a, as a teacher. But the role that I value the most, uh, anyone that knows me well, is the role of a father and husband. I, I'm father of a 14-year-old and 16-year-old who attend uh, the local public high school uh, in Connecticut. And uh, my wife, uh, who is a family school liaison, and her job is to really re-engage families that maybe we weren't able to engage well. So um, I'm a husband of an educator and parent of uh, two students in high school. So this experience uh, from the, uh, of the pandemic, not only as a commissioner of education, but also as a father and husband, um, I've experienced a lot of the same emotions that everyone across the country has uh, experienced for their loved ones um, who work in the school system and for their students who are missing out on so many experiences when uh, unable to return to school safely. 
Um, I'm fortunate that my students have had the opportunity to return to school safely because the district uh, where, where I live um, is committed also to making sure that they do everything they can to provide those in-person learning opportunities. Honored to be here. Uh, I look forward, more importantly than anything I say today, I look forward to having a, an ongoing relationship with NASB and uh, good dialogue uh, as Secretary of Education on how best to support the important work you do. I think people forget you're volunteers and you're giving your best to help children. And I'm with you on that mission and I look forward to supporting you and to hearing from you how we can do better. Um, I wanna be very clear that my primary goal is safely reopening schools as quickly as possible. And while we can talk about what the fall will look like, the time is now to safely reopen our schools to give students an opportunity to get back in the spring and engage with their friends and with those activities that we know make schools more than just a place to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's a community. It's a community. And um, I like to add that fourth R of relationships. You know, our students, uh, it, it's harder to have those relationships through a, through a computer feed. Um, even if your computer access is good, even if your internet signal is good, it's still hard to build that sense of community uh, as it is in the classroom when it can be done safely. So that is my primary goal. However, as you know, and as I know, even before the pandemic, uh, achievement disparities and access and opportunity disparities have long plagued our education system. It didn't take the pandemic for, for us to be thinking about uh, how some students, whether by race or place, have better opportunities than others. The pandemic just exacerbated it. It made it worse. It put it in everyone's face. And it really created a level of urgency that if we don't, if we're not moved by this level of urgency now, then we, we're in the wrong business. Um, and the pandemic has really exacerbated those gaps. And for me, it's critically important that co collectively we unapologetically address what Dr. Pedro Nogueiro calls the normalization of failure um, that has plagued our country for, for decades and decades, as long as we've been uh, keeping track of uh, student performance. So that's a, a major focus. Another major focus that in my preparation for, for my hearing and my conversations with different folks all across the country is we need to create uh, better uh, college and career pathways for all students. So, you know, the, the pathways to four-year colleges are great, but we also have two-year colleges and we have certification programs and we have careers that exist now that are not being filled because there are no clear viable pathways to them. So we have to make our pathways not only viable to the different options that exist there, but also affordable so all students can access them. And while we do that, we have to make sure that we're evolving our systems so that our students are exposed to things earlier, middle school, high school pathways, credit bearing pathways, internship pathways. But when we do this, we have to guard against tracking. All students have opportunities to attend four-year colleges or two-year colleges or, or, or have pathways into the workforce. So these are some of the priorities that I have. I also believe that college access uh, needs to be for everyone. That not only do we have to think about loan forgiveness and have those conversations, but making sure we don't get back into the situation where people owe three, $400,000 and can't buy a home because they're so in debt in college. How do we make college affordable so everyone has access to it? Too many students turn off those dreams or, or change their minds about going to college because they're afraid of the price tag. We need to do better. They deserve better. I'm also passionate about making sure that we remove whatever silos are created in education or whatever barriers to communication exist. You know, we learned through COVID-19 and my experience in Connecticut under the wonderful leadership of not only Chair Taylor, but Chair Lopez, uh, uh, Member Benham, there's Woody, there's so many great, all the board members in, in Connecticut have really helped us create a culture where we're learning from one another. We learned that in some districts, their reopening strategy used the following specific things that we needed to share with another district. So how do we remove silos across the country where we learn from other uh, states or other large communities what's working and we can have students in another state benefit from that knowledge by having the, the leaders talk together, by having the boards talk together. We need to remove silos in education. And lastly, we need to control the narrative for education in our country. 
for far too long, we've been playing defense and responding to others' criticisms about our public schools. I'm proud of the schools that we have in our country and the work of our educators and our boards and our superintendents to try to make the best with the challenges that they have. And they do it with love. And I'm talking about food insecurity, housing pattern symptoms that segregate our schools, students that have uh, housing instability, students that have such great social emotional needs or mental health needs that our schools provide that safe learning environment. We have a lot of work to do. And I know the closer we work together, the further along our students will be. Last week, I was proud to announce the 100 $22 billion package to support schools in our communities. Letters went out to states with their allotment. And we hope before the end of the month that the funding will be in those states so that they can get to work, reopening schools safely. They needed the resources. I haven't met an educator that doesn't want their children in school, but they need it done safely. We were also proud to announce that the Health and Human Services provided $10 billion for additional surveillance testing for educators to ensure that we can keep our schools open. You know, with routine testing, um, there's a greater likelihood that we won't have to quarantine educators and keep our schools open for our students. And then lastly, last week we announced that this Wednesday, we're gonna have a, our first national school reopening summit where we're gonna hear from different states, different districts on what worked and what didn't work. We learn best from listening to one another. So we're gonna create that opportunity and we're setting up a clearinghouse to hear best practices around reopening, social emotional supports, and how you can get students safely back in school. You know, if we come together as one learning community in this country, the potential is limitless. So on this call, I wanna just start off by saying thank you to all the board members across the country for your labor of love, for putting students first at the center of the conversation. I've been fortunate and I've, I've benefited from strong leadership in Connecticut with our board. And I know I wouldn't be Secretary of Education if it wasn't for the strong leadership in Connecticut from our board. So I wanna thank uh, Chairman Taylor uh, and all of you for the great work you do as uh, board members. And let's remember our ceiling cannot be to reopen schools to what they were in March of 2020. We have to aim higher. Our kids deserve it. And I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and partnering with you to make it happen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Cardona. We really appreciate your comments. And um, the, many of the things that you have commented on are the very things that state boards of education are talking about every single month at the board table. And it's, um, it's gratifying to know that the person sitting in the secretary's seat is someone who has worked with the state board and someone who understands the constituents that you're talking about uh, talking to right here and know that those issues are first and foremost on state board's agendas as they focused on equity and excellence for every single student. And we are very heartened by the level of collaboration that we've seen both from um, but your, your, uh, your staff and, uh, and those that have preceded you here during this administration. We thank you for that. And um, during this, set, during this uh, conference uh, today and tomorrow, we're delving into many of those issues that you just outlined. We're delving into um, uh, the use of the funds that, that, that states have now uh, been given. And um, so anyway, thank you so much for setting that stage. And we also are looking forward to the summit that you have announced. We've been sharing that invitation widely, hoping that we can get a lot of state board members to participate. So thank you for that. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, three of our NASB board of directors um, to join us by uh, starting their videos. That would be our immediate past chair, our current chair, and our incoming chair. We're going to join us for this conversation to allow them to, uh, to speak with you and to have some interaction. But as they're coming on, I'm, I'm going to start with the first question that we've already said that most recently that uh, prior to coming to uh, the department as secretary, you had the opportunity to work with the Connecticut State Board of Education in your job as commissioner. Based on your experience there and working with uh, your board and also observing other boards from across the country, what role do you see boards of education playing in furthering the priorities that you had established, you have established for the Department of Education while still being attuned to the unique context in the particular states? That's a great question. You know, in addition to policy 
and ensuring that policy safeguards equity and advancement. The board really needs to make sure that they're supporting the administration, but also guiding based on principles uh, that they've established as a board. So one thing that I benefit from as a commissioner of education is that we had a board while very diverse in not only experiences and, and were, uh, you know, uh, their, their beliefs around different priorities, they came together with a common purpose to advance education in Connecticut. And they did so in a manner that uh, promoted good discourse. Um, they didn't shy away from the tough issues. Um, they really made sure that we as, a, as an administration of, of the State Board of Education, uh, of the State uh, Education System, focused on those issues that were most important. Uh, issues of access, of equity. They made sure that when we made hires, we got people that were similar in, in their mind in their thinking. Uh, they also made sure that we held ourselves accountable by looking at data regularly. So they took an interest in this, they worked with us, they supported us, but they also made sure that we were doing what we were supposed to be doing, which was ensuring the access and, and um, attainment of, of quality education for all students across the state. So they modeled that. And then in the time of crisis, when everything is up in the air and many, many things were being done by executive order, they maintained a level of professionalism, contact, guidance to the administration, and they modeled what we wanted to see in the different communities across Connecticut. Um, so they really, they really stood themselves up as a model board, in my opinion, on how to support administration and how to stay true to the values and how to hold them accountable, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to turn now to my colleagues and friends from the NASB Board of Directors. We have three who have joined us, and we're going to take this in chronological order. We're going to begin with our immediate past chair. Um, Brooke Axiotis is a um, state board member in Iowa, former chairman of our board and former chair of the Iowa State Board. So, Brooke, thank you for joining the conversation, and um, we open the mic for you to have a conversation now with the secretary. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Robert. And thank you, Secretary Cardona, for joining us today. <clears throat> so I just have a question. Um, you know, last year in June, um, I think the country, we'd all say, had, um, a, I guess, a reckoning around race and equity. Um, so many people, I think, who hadn't spoken out before felt empowered to speak out on issues around race um, and diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think we saw a lot of things since June um, happening um, around the country. I think a lot of positive things have been, um, you know, for the protests um, and just people speaking out. And I think there are a lot of changes that have been made in terms of trying to be more inclusive in board members and in hiring, um, which has all been really good. Um, <clears throat> and it's important, I think, for us to have difficult conversations. And um, I think not only to have those difficult conversations, but I think it's important for those having the difficult conversations to feel like they um, are comfortable facilitating them, right? Because those difficulties can be really, really fruitful, but they can also be disastrous if it's uh, done in, a, in an inappropriate or harmful way, especially when I'm with children. Um, so in the Iowa legislature, there have been a few bills that have been introduced, um, which would discourage um, those conversations from being held um, in the classroom setting. So things like the um, banning the 1619 project, talking about our history um, with slavery, um, and these are things that have, um, you know, kind of been brought up to be safe in the setting of a classroom um, and have kind of empowered teachers to be able to talk about these subjects, which are difficult to talk about, but are important for us to talk about to grow. Um, so how do we empower our educators to be able to hold these um, difficult conversations um, instead of suppress them? Because these are really important, as I said before, but I think these bills have kind of said that these conversations are really divisive and they cast blame and therefore they shouldn't be held, especially in the classroom setting and our students shouldn't be hearing anything like this because they're gonna grow up thinking, you know, that it's their fault or something. So um, how do we and just encourage and empower our teachers to feel safe and comfortable being able to have these difficult conversations, which I think are just so, if we're gonna move forward with this equity and this movement, I think we really have to capture this and we really have to support our teachers in this um, and help them to be able to have these and not suppress them. This is not the time, so. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Thank you for that question. I hope you feel better. Um, but uh, that's a great question. I, I appreciate you asking it. Before I get into the response to that, I just want to quickly shout out uh, Adam Honeyset uh, on our staff who's on this call also. Adam, I remember getting his emails as commissioner of education and uh, you know, I thought he was a rock star back then. Now I, I know he is. Um, thank you, Adam, for, for all you're doing uh, to engage. You know, Brooke, you bring up a good, a good point. Let's not forget that we, we are suffering through two pandemics, right? So we had two silent pandemics, COVID, and then that, that racial divide or that disconnect or that discord across our country, you know, there's a lot of healing that has to happen. And, you know, you brought up so many, Brooke, you, we could talk for another hour about this. You brought up so many different points and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give the top lines on them because honestly, we really could continue for, for a long time. Number one, we need to be open and honest. It's not enough to put lawn signs up. It's not enough to have random acts of equity. We, if we're serious about it and you're in such a critical role as board members, you set policy, you set the vision, you set the goals, where, where are we going? And, you know, fighting for equity or discussing it or, and, and it's okay to talk about wrongs in the past and learn from them. We're having a conference in two days talking about school reopening. And I wanna hear just as much about mistakes that were made because we're gonna learn better. We're not going to repeat them if we if we talk about what we did when we tried to reopen that didn't work well. So I really feel like you know oftentimes in education we're we're playing defense. We really have to say this is good for kids because. And then the last thing I'll say to this, Brooke, and by far the most important part of the response. Our students have voice. Sometimes as adults we need to get out of the way and listen. They want to talk to us. They want to learn about this. And we're minimizing their potential when we think they can't handle the truth. We're, we're, we're setting low expectations when we think they can't look at two different sides of an issue. We're setting low expectations for our students if we think that we can't give them the tools to think openly. So my point here is when we empower our students to be active participants in their learning, these topics will come up because guess what, bro? They're talking about it outside of school. They're seeing their television sets outside of school. They're seeing social media. Shame on us if we can't engage as educators in the conversation when they're seeing it everywhere outside of school. Isn't that the role of our schools? So we can do so and keep high expectations for our learners, but also empower our learners to be active participants in communicating what it is they wanna learn about so that these things come up naturally. Our students have had voice. Again, our institutions sometimes are not designed to listen to them, but that's our job as policymakers and as educational leaders to make sure that our students are at the center of the conversation. Thank you, Secretary Cardona, and you are exactly right. And we at NASB are a proponent of not only students having voice in the learning, but students having voice in governance. Uh, it's our proponent that every state board should have some mechanism of having either board a student at the table or some way to get that student voice and governance. So thank you for reinforcing our point as well. So let's move now to uh, Byron Ernest, who is our current board chair uh, at NASB. So Byron. Secretary Cardona, I really appreciate you being with us today and uh, and I appreciate you and, and your service. And so we, we know we've learned a lot about leading through a crisis um, over the past 377 days now. Um, and, and the pandemic has challenged states to be more agile or nimble and responding to new conditions, new data has prompted us as states to reimagine school as no longer being a single place, but recognize that learning occurs everywhere, can be 24 seven, we can have remote learning at home, a hybrid setting or on site. Um, we've learned all that now, right? And so when we rethink the meaning of school, there's a cascade of consequences. And some of those are positive, like increased value and the evidence of parent and family engagement that we've seen um, through all of this. And I personally wanna double down on rethinking what success looks like in education. And, and how that success reshapes accountability to realign our, our new version of success and really think about what success needs to look like. So my question has two parts to it. How do we keep this momentum going 
um, to catapult us toward a, a better education system as we look toward recovery? And then how do you see the department offering state support and flexibility to redesign the systems while holding the line on accountability and equity and, and excellence? Great question, um, Byron. I, I appreciate just the, the whole, the gravity of that question. You know, I said earlier, our ceiling shouldn't be March 10th of last year. That shouldn't be what we're aiming for. We have the uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to hit the reset on some things that we can walk away from. And we have to be strong enough uh, collectively as leaders to be able to challenge those things that we know perpetuated inequity, limited um, what we define as success. This is our opportunity. You know, the American Rescue Plan provides funds for us to really rethink what extended learning time looks like, what summer opportunities look like, what the makeup of our school looks like. If we go back to a school where social emotional support is a 30 minute on a Friday, or you go see the one school counselor for 800 kids, we fail. We just, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We need to rethink how our schools are designed to make sure that they're meeting the needs of today's students and tomorrow's students. So I welcome, I welcome innovation. I welcome what you said, you know, it's not only seat time in the building. We see some students are taking courses now that they never would have had if they were confined to what they offered in that school. We need to think outside the box. The students deserve that. So how do we keep ourselves accountable? How do we make sure that we don't, in this process, provide some uh, innovative opportunities for some students, but not others? We have to be open and honest about equity and inequities that exist so that we don't repeat them. You know, the, the I'll tell you a quick story, Brian. One of, the, one of the things that I remember most from early April last year was having a conversation with a superintendent of a very well-resourced district. Said, Miguel, we're fortunate. All we had to do was turn on the switch. All of our students have devices. All of our students have tremendous internet access, strong, good system. And when they log on, we have all of our curriculum modified so that it's online. They have access to all the materials, the videos, the good connections. We just flipped the switch, Miguel. I talked to a superintendent in a district that was very poorly resourced, a lot of turnover in superintendency, um, a lot of need. And four weeks later, they still haven't communicated with students. That's what we had a year ago. How do we take what you said, Byron, and ensure that we never go back to that? So that not only are we providing innovation and not, not only are we doing things that we would never have considered a year ago. But we're also bold enough and honest enough to say these students were harmed more than these students. And we're gonna take the American Rescue Plan and ensure that we're correcting this in this one shot that we have to get it right. So that's courageous leadership, that's bold leadership and that's innovative leadership too. Um, so I, I, I look forward to the innovations that are gonna be coming forward. And I look forward to not only hearing about them and, and, and listening to what you're thinking, but also to elevating those best practices that are aimed at making the education system in our country better than it ever was prior to the pandemic and making sure that we once and for all address some of these issues that can be addressed like the digital divide. Using the resources that the government, uh, that the uh, president and the vice president uh, put forth and our, our, our partners in Congress put forth to say, this is our time, let's make the most of that and address those issues and be innovative in the process. Again, another response that can go on for, for, for a long time. Thank you for that question. Oh, and thank you for that excellent answer and a, a, a charge for us to remember. And uh, Mr. Secretary, I know that we're on a time schedule here, but we have one final question. If that's okay, we can ask uh, uh, Janet that's Cannon. Fine. who He's our, I don't wanna keep you longer. I know you have other places to be, but um, I'd like to introduce now Janet Cannon from the state of Utah who is our incoming president. So Janet, if you have a question for the secretary, um, will let this be the last question, Janet? Thank you so much, secretary. 
uh, Cardona for being with us at 20 days on the job. You've really hit the ground running and we couldn't appreciate more your taking time to be with us. Uh, I will we'll make my question brief. Uh, the pandemic has really highlighted for everyone in education, the inequities in digital access for students. I know in Utah, we've just spent some $6 million on an Indian reservation in the Red Rocks of Southern Utah to try to bring internet access to these students who've never had it before and who didn't have it for most of the pandemic. So my question to you is, how can we address this inequity and do you have plans for doing so? Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, I, I, I recognize that the digital divide uh, is much more challenging in some states more than Connecticut. Even though in Connecticut, we had some communities that had poor access. Um, I've, I've spoken to uh, American Indians and, and even in Alaska where, where you know, you're so far, so remote that having access to school remotely is just such a challenge. I'm pleased that the American Rescue Plan has over $7 billion to address this. And we need to not only have the funds, but we need to be creative and innovative and work with our uh, private sector as well to find creative solutions to making sure that our students have access and our educators have access. A lot of teachers don't have strong access in their homes. I remember being on calls with 50 commissioners of education and some of the commissioners of education didn't have good access in their homes. So we have to close this digital divide. And it's not only education that uh, our students risk if they don't have it, it's access to tele uh, support, uh, mental health support through the computer, uh, telemedicine. It, it, it's access to um, you know, so many other things that uh, that internet pr uh, connection provides, security and safety. So yes, it's part of the plan. And you know what, I'm gonna be hearing from examples in the communities that are doing it, that are finding ways to do it, lifting those up, removing those silos to make those best practices. We are providing funding for that, uh, as I said before, but the innovation and the ideas are always gonna come from the field. We do have folks that we're gonna be working with to try to brainstorm with us, national experts, but as always in education, the innovation comes from the source of the challenge because our educators are so innovative. Look at what they did this past year. And I think it's also important to close this response with, Let's not forget that there's training needed for this. That just because you put a beautiful laptop in front of the, an educator and, and good Wi-Fi doesn't mean that uh, instantly the best pedagogical skills on um, instruction using remote learning is, is, is there. We need to invest in uh, capacity building for our educators, for our school leaders, our district leaders, so they could see how to best maximize the use of technology. And as was asked in the question before by Byron, we need to be forward thinking about how we can engage technology to give students more opportunities than they ever had before in learning remotely. So those are just some of the uh, some of the thoughts I have on that. And I'll just close really quickly by saying, Robert, thank you for the invitation. Uh, there, there'll be more of these. And, and again, I, I want this to be more than a symbolic hello. I really want to engage with you, listen, learn from you. Uh, I, I grew so much with the strong leadership of the board in Connecticut, and I know across the country will gain and our students will gain the closer we work together. So thank you for the few minutes here today and I hope you, you enjoy the rest of your conference. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's been a pleasure to host you today and we look forward to continuing this conversation. And as um, as you can uh, for your, your journey here, if we can at NASB be of any assistance to you or if we can get have the state boards be of assistance to you, please know that we're here to support and to help you achieve the uh, the uh, goals that you've outlined for your administration.